call to the 10th session of our foundation course in palliative medicine. Today it is exactly the halfway of the course and we are entering uh, the symptoms management and today we'll be discussing one of the most commonest come across uh, symptoms, the first part of gastrointestinal symptoms with today's focus on nausea, vomiting and constipation. And it is uh, my personal privilege and pleasure to welcome back Dr. Vinita Riju for walking us through the session after a short uh, break. So for former faculty introduction for the session facilitation, I hand over it to Dr. Sunil Kumar. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Sir Priya. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so uh, today um, we will start with the uh, GA symptoms and there is one more course on GA symptoms. So, uh, nausea and vomiting, constipation, which are uh, the most important uh, symptoms and uh, which are often neglected uh, and uh, probably we don't understand uh, the importance of constipation. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Vinita will uh, give us an overview of uh, nausea, vomiting uh, and constipation. So. Uh, Vinita was uh, working as a um, palliative care physician uh, at Calicut uh, and she has done her uh, certificate course as well as uh, um, MSc in Cardiff, uh, MSc in palliative medicine from Cardiff University. And uh, uh, she has, uh, she was working as a palliative care physician at uh, uh, Aster Mims at Calicut uh, and uh, after that in Kochi. Uh, but uh, later she joined um, the postgraduate program in MD in Community Medicine at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, uh, one of the um, main uh, important thing is that uh, she was uh, working to integrate uh, palliative care in oncology. So, um, she, uh, welcome, Vinita, and it's over to you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Suhil and uh, Sri Priya. Thank you for having me here. And uh, a very good evening to all of you who are here. And today we have a very common uh, symptom to discuss here, a GI symptom to discuss here for today's topic. As much as common it is, uh, it is very important to know how we manage uh, nausea and vomiting symptoms in our patient. So let me just uh, share my screen right now. Yeah. Uh, Sri Priya, is my slides moving? Yes, yeah, it's good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So um, I'm sure all of you have had patients who have had difficult symptoms, uh, difficult to control nausea and vomiting. So uh, can we just have a little discussion on uh, what would you uh, normally suggest for a patient who has come to you with nausea and vomiting? What do you usually prescribe them? You can use the chat box. This is not a one-way lecture, so let's have a, a studying session here, both sides. Yes, I have a lot of answers coming up here. Dr. Yamini, uh, Dr. Nadeem, Dr. Chakrati, Dr. Nikhil, Dr. Putumila, uh, Dr. Junita, Dr. Naraj. Yes, a lot of you all who opt for Ondensitron and Dr. Junita and Dr. Radha, yes, metacropamide. And Dr. Parul would also like to add in antacids, Dr. Honey, uh, Domperidone. Yes, these are our common, uh, usually Dr. Dimple also adds in Domperidone. Yes, Dr. Sujarita also. Thank you so much for those responses. So these are our commonest um, antiemetics, as to say, that we usually prescribe for our patients. 
And I really like that what Dr. Bidhu has commented here. We have to find out the cause of the vomiting, whether it's central or peripheral. Yes. So most often what, ha what happens in the clinics is that someone comes to you with a, um, a complaint of nausea and vomiting, and we have a blanket prescription that goes, that says on and citron, metacropamide. But what I would like to bring today to everybody's focus is that we need to dwell into what is the cause of the vomiting. And once you understand the cause of the vomiting, we can deal with the symptom more scientifically. Okay. So let's go through what we have here. Yes. So today we will be uh, trying to look into what are the common GI problems in palliative cancer. And uh, what I intend to do is discuss nausea and vomiting and constipation today. And uh, we will have another class on uh, the GI symptom bubble obstruction, malignant bubble obstruction on another day. And we will be looking into the management of nausea, vomiting and constipation. So how different is nausea from vomiting? Yes. Chat box. How different is nausea from vomiting? Someone tells you that they're having severe nausea and someone tells you that they're having severe vomiting. Yes, Dr. Putumala says nausea is more of a symptom. Okay. And is vomiting is more of a sign. Yeah. More answers. Uh, nausea is a sensation uh, that of uh, mm -hmm. MSS, whereas vomiting is frank MSS. Yes, you have actually the contents coming out, right? Yes, and we also have a lot of responses here. Nausea is a sensation of vomiting and can be troublesome sometimes. Yes, a lot of you do agree to that. Nausea is more of a feeling of that you are going to vomit. And uh, Dr. Jagruti um, also agrees to that. And uh, Dr. Uh, Punita Vati says that food intake is severely affected and so is the nutrition. Yes, when you are unable to take in food because of severe nausea, it might also affect nutrition. And so goes for vomiting because the feeling and the action of vomiting is equally distressing for the patient. And uh, yes, nausea can cause more distress than vomiting. Sometimes what happens is that when the patient is not actually having a propulsion of the contents, the very distress of want to vomit, want to vomit, want to vomit, that itself causes so much of uh, difficulty. It's not just the fact of he's not able to eat food, but it can also affect him in many other ways. And uh, even his social indulgence with the people around him. And uh, sometimes it so happens that even when uh, patients who are undergoing cancer treatment and uh, they uh, have a very bad episode of vomiting associated with the chemotherapy. And the very fact that they have had a very bad episode uh, tends to trigger that kind of nausea uh, within them, even before they come for the next chemo. I'm sure many of you have seen that. Yes, so as I move on, to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a situation here. Uh, a 54-year-old frail lady with gastric carcinoma on chemotherapy. Now, she is admitted to the general ward for a treatment of urinary tract infection. And she was admitted with vomiting, abdominal colic, and fever. And she is tired and has admitted for completion uh, of her IV antibiotics. So the IV antibiotics, which is given for her urinary tract infection. Now she is having small, frequent, incomplete bowel movements for four days and is started on laxatives. She's accompanied by her younger daughter. Okay. And I want you to think, uh, take less than a minute to think over this situation. And you as a physician, what would you like to 
manage her with. And before you think about what you are going to manage her with, you will have to assess what could be the causes over here. I want you to think over this. And we are going to come back to the situation, to this very own situation after the class, after the lecture series, so that I want you to understand if there has been a difference in the way that you think. Okay. So what is emesis? So emesis as such is the biological defense mechanism to remove the toxic or harmful substances from the body after ingesting. And it can be nausea, retching, and vomiting. So as you know, retching is also more of a feeling that actually the vomitus doesn't come out. So nausea, like you all said, it is an unpleasant sensation of the imminent need to vomit. Vomiting is a forceful expulsion of gastric contents associated with contraction of the abdominal and the chest wall musculature. Whereas coming to retching, there is a lot of things happening there. You have the spasmodic respiratory movements against a closed glottis, contraction of the abdominal musculatures, but there is no expulsion of the gastric contents. Now, regurgitation can be something where you actually feel the foot coming all the way up to your mouth. And here, there is not much abdominal or diaphragmatic muscular activity that happens, which is so typically seen in vomit. So what are the types of vomiting? How can you differentiate or classify vomiting in terms of, um, say, the duration of vomiting? Any ideas? Vomiting can be projectile and non-projectile. Yes. Be and non bilious uh, yes, yes, that was wonderful. Yeah, exactly. It can be projectile, it can be non bilious, it can be non projectile, and these are all giving you kind of clues as to what could be the cause, right? And uh, yes, Dr. Nickel also agrees with that projectile. And Dr. Nishad say, what about chronic and acute? Yes, definitely. A vomiting which has been persisting and a vomiting where there has been a trigger factor and there is an acute episode. Yes. Anticipatory, madam. Anticipatory moment. Yes, absolutely. Exactly the same uh, case that we were talking about. Some patient who has had a very bad experience uh, who went, for, went in for her chemotherapy and uh, with uh, drugs which were you know, having a very severe emetogenic potential. And uh, the very thought of going in the next day for the chemotherapy is going to trigger the nausea and vomiting. And uh, Dr. Kevin Kumar says that there could be, you can classify it according to the associated factors. And again, Dr. Bidhu would like to add in saying that it could be centrally induced and peripherally induced, and you could classify according to that. And I have put it across here like this. Acute, where you would have vomiting, which is occurring within few minutes, two hours, and uh, from the trigger, and resolving in 24 hours. So uh, say, suppose a patient is having a cisplatin, a platinum-based chemotherapy, say like cisplatin, and uh, the, uh, it is so emetogenic that, you know, the patient starts vomiting uh, within that probably that one hour of taking uh, the drug. Whereas there are other drugs, say, suppose, you know, um, less emetogenic, say, like gemcitabin. Um, the patient might go home and it might be probably even after a day that the patient starts developing the vomiting. And this can last for a few days, and that's what we call delay. So occurring usually after 24 hours of chemotherapy, and it kind of peaks from 48 to 72 hours following the chemotherapy, and could probably last for about seven days. And it could be also aggravated by multiple other factors, which could worsen the vomiting. 
Now, how about breakthrough vomiting? Breakthrough vomiting. Your patient who has come to you with vomiting, you have prescribed an anti-emetic medication. Say the patient has come to you and you have prescribed metacropamide. Yes, and three times daily. And yet the patient vomits. The patient has his morning dose. And even before he can have his, uh, even before he can have his afternoon dose, he starts vomiting again. He was better after he took his morning medication. But before he takes his afternoon medication, he starts vomiting again. This is breakthrough vomiting. How about refractory vomiting? How would you how would you say uh, how would you say refractory vomiting is? How different is it from breakthrough vomiting? Not responding. Yes, you have your patient who is on three times metacropamide, or probably you have tried some other drug. Uh, according to its um, recommended frequency, and you are not able to manage, you are not able to control the emesis, not responding to treatment. Yes, all of you have said that. Dr. Biju, Dr. Parul, Dr. Sultana, all of you have agreed to that, that refractory vomiting is about not being able to control the vomiting with the anti-emetic uh, medication at the required and um, uh, at the recommended dose and frequency. Now, uh, anticipatory vomiting is like what we had just discussed some time back and like what um, you, know, you had mentioned also, conditioned response prior to chemotherapy. So how are we, how are we actually going to manage each one of these? Are we going to use the same drug? Or are we actually going to uh, have a plan? Okay, this is chemo-induced vomiting, so I am going to give this. This is anticipatory vomiting, so I am going to give this. So this is exactly what we are going to come into now. Before that, a very important question. Why is it important to control vomiting? So uh, one of you did mention that, you know, vomiting does come from a compromise on the intake and it is going to affect the nutrition of the patient. But what more? What more could be there to it? Why are we having an entire session of nausea and vomiting? Yes, could be anxiety induced. There could be ultralight balance, imbalance, which could lead to tiredness. And uh, Dr. Darpali also says to avoid dehydration. Yes, Dr. Nikhil says that it could be the patient is in distress, nutrition is affected and may feel like not taking treatment. Yes, and affects quality of life, comfort, uh, causes suffering and psychological effects. And this is a very vicious cycle, I would say. Like, you know, um, we were just trying to say that how Dr. Nikhil was saying may not be like taking treatment. Because if the patient, say, like, just like how I was saying, the patient is uh, having to go in for his chemotherapy the next day and already starts having anticipatory vomiting. And this is going to stop him from taking uh, the next dose. You might say, oh, I am not going to go there. It's enough of suffering that I already have. I do not want this suffering also. So this will affect the compliance to the treatment, like how Dr. Sujaitra was, Sujaitra was saying here. It is going to affect the compliance to the treatment. What if the patient is on some analgesics for pain control? And we all know that NSAIDs can cause nausea and vomiting. What if he just stops taking all analgesics altogether? He doesn't believe that this drug has caused this and Maybe, you know, just substituting that drug for another is going to help. He just stops taking all medications. He is going to be feeling sick altogether. 
So it is indeed very important to manage uh, vomiting. It affects the patient's daily functioning, quality of life, non-compliance to any treatment, refusal of effective pain medications, and patient's distress is the family's distress. So it is in turn going to cause family distress. Uh, uh, Ma'am, can forceful yeah. retching cause some sort of tears? Yes, it can. Forceful retching can also cause, because what happens is that, you know, most often I have heard like um, patients have so much of nausea, they feel that what if they vomit, they feel better. So sometimes they actually try to put their finger or something to like, you know, forcefully retch out and vomit, just thinking that they might feel better after that. So that itself can cause mucosal aberration, which can cause irritations and uh, cause further nausea in patients. Now, coming to causes for nausea and vomiting. Here I have listed a few causes for nausea and vomiting. Chemically induced nausea, gastric stasis, uh, stretch of the GI tract, serosal irritation, irritation of the GI tract, raised intracranial tension, movement associated, anxiety induced environment. Let's go through each. So chemically induced nausea. Can you give me an example? Yes, we did have some, uh, uh, we did have some messages here saying, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please go, please go on. Yeah. Yeah. Chemodrugs and uh, opioids. Yes, yes. Um, uh, chemotherapy drugs, opioids. Yes, we have a lot of you who have mentioned that in the chat as well. Opioids, chemotherapy. Yes, anything else? Yes, uh, narcotics. Yes. Dr. Nikhil also says cyclosporin. Yes. Group of drugs, which can cause chemically induced nausea. Anything else? Okay, other than drugs, chemically induced Some nausea. Antibiotics also. Yes, antibiotics can also cause. Metronidazole, yes, metronidazole causes the severe metallic kind of taste, which causes nausea. And NSAIDs can also cause nausea. Yes. Uremia, yes, can also cause nausea. Yes, we have all the metabolic causes that can cause nausea. The order of the food being prepared. As much as we, you know, we take it for granted, most of the patients are being given bland food. Uh, we think it is, you know, heavily, uh, it, it is nutritious and it is good for the patient, but for the patient, it has no order or sometimes the patient is in a, uh, in a hospital ward with different kind of orders around him and that itself causes nausea. And anxiety, anxiety can also cause nausea, yes. So how about UTI? Yes, we get, um, we get also um, input saying UTI can cause nausea. And how about gastric stasis? Do you know of something that can cause gastric stasis, which can cause nausea or vomiting? What can cause? Yes, uh, Dr. Ashoke also says uh, hyperacidity. And we have a question here by Dr. Babu that asks that uh, whether no anemia causes GI, anemia causes GI, anemia may cause. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand that. Would you like to um, ask me that? If you could switch on your mic. Anemia causes GI. Would you like to just clarify that, Dr. Bhatta? Or you can just uh, type it once again in the chat. Yes, uh, we also have other uh, uh, answers over here saying raised intracranial pressure, opioids like morphine, paralytic ileus, hypokalemia, all this gastric stasis. Okay, now gastric stasis can cause 
uh, again, nausea and vomiting. He has metabolic causes like hypokalemia is uh, commonly again seen among our patients. Now uh, we have stretch or dis distortion of the GI tract. Stretch or distortion of the GI tract. Usually seen in Okay, I also have answers here saying uh, bowel obstruction, constipation, small intestinal infection, CA head pancreas, age related stasis, vertigo, gastric infection during neutropenia after chemo, a gastric outlet obstruction. Yes, stasis. Uh, Dr. Kevin Kumar also says about dumping syndrome or tumors, Dr. Lalita was talking about. Yeah, so uh, stretch receptors is when there is actually uh, the, say, suppose the intestines are getting stretched. There is some amount of tumor there obstructing there, and uh, that can also cause not seeing anything. Serosal irritation. Serosal irritation. Now, what could cause serosal irritation? Sorry, I didn't keep the chat box now. Peritonitis? Yes. Peritonitis? Yes, we have a lot of other answers of the coming here. Uh, other causes for... Uh, gastritis? Gastritis. Um, yeah, I would uh, put that as irritation of the GI tract. Okay. Tumor invasion. Tumor invasion, okay. How about uh, when uh, there is a hepatic tumor or there is a stretch of the liver capsule that also could cause? And uh, okay, radiation induced serositis, like mucositis. Yes, yes, that also can cause. And uh, Uretric, uh, uretric cal uh, calculus, sometimes a stretch of the ureter, that can also cause, right? And yeah, we also have many other causes just being listed out in the chat box, like metastasis, perforation, ascites, appendicitis. Yes, thank you so much for those responses. So uh, let's just open the box and see. Yes, so like most of you have already answered, we have drugs like opioids, antibiotics, cytotoxics, or even toxins like food poisoning, ischemic bowel obstruction, metabolic organ failure, like all of you have already said about uremia and things like that. And gastric stasis. Gastric stasis, like, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, patients come to us with uh, severe abdominal pain. And uh, when you hear it's a colicky abdominal pain, we tend to give cyclopam, a buscopam, an anticholinergic drug. And what happens is that it has an antispasmodic activity. It causes some amount of stasis. And this can also lead to nausea and vomiting. So uh, opioids, uh, ascites, peptic ulcer gastritis, also causes like some drugs, uh, radiotherapy, autonomic failures, all these can also cause gastric stasis. Now, stretch of the GI tract, it can be because of intestinal obstructions, it can be because of constipations, it can be because of the metastasis. All this can again lead on to nausea and vomiting. Now, serosal irritation, uh, like liver meds, uretric obstruction, irritations of the GI tract, like infections again, uh, NSAIDs, all this, and uh, raised intracranial uh, pressures, like we were talking about the projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting, as you all know, is not usually followed, uh, preceded by an ossea. It's sudden and projectile. 
So uh, this is caused because of cerebral edema, uh, space occupying lesions or intracerebral bleeds or even infections like meningitis. Movement associated uh, vestibular disorders. So what happens sometimes is that, you know, you're just planning a nice holiday to a nice hill station, going on a hairpin and there that triggers uh, movement associated nausea and vomiting. And uh, uh, that's exactly one of the other reasons. Anxiety induced, like you have all had already mentioned, anxiety does cause a lot uh, um, among a lot of patients uh, nausea. And under this category also comes the anticipate vomiting. Now, environment, uh, like uh, you had already mentioned, is a fact that you know most of us take for granted. So. Uh, always remember that it is also a very important contributing factor for nausea and vomiting. So you can always check if the environment that the patient is uh, having his food is uh, order free, is clean, and um, if not, we can advise accordingly. Okay, and also the distaste for food. All right, so. Apart from these, okay, now I have uh, listed here quite a few. Now, apart from these, do you think that, um, uh, do you actually think that uh, there are some other reasons also? As Dr. Biju was saying about bleeding. Yes, Dr. Uh, Satyanarayana Raju uh, was talking about candida infection. So, so very common, you know. Most often what happens is that, you know, when we go for home care, set, uh, when we go to the home care settings and the family tells you that, yes, my father had been eating uh, kind of okay, but for the past one week, he has not been eating enough. And for the past two days, practically nothing. Uh, he just says that he doesn't want. And all you have to do is a one clinical examination. You just open the mouth and examine the oral cavity and you can see oral thrush. And that is one of uh, the most important causes for your patient's vomiting. And uh, yes, we also have some responses here like intraperitoneal chemotherapy, hepatic dysfunction, again, contributing uh, uh, to a metabolic, uh, metabolic dysfunctions. Yeah, so like I was saying, um, what else? After a CSF tap, yes. So uh, sometimes after a CSF tap, um, there is a headache and again, a vomiting that is sometimes seen. Can a diabetic um, gastroparesis cause gastric stasis, cause nausea? Yes, Just... yes, it can, it can, it does. Pain induced. Yes, I have seen this. I uh, very well understand uh, what uh, Dr. Paru was trying to say. I have seen how uh, some patients, you know, because of their pain, um, uh, they have nausea and vomiting. And it just makes you uh, understand that the symptom nausea and vomiting is multifactorial. So it has a physical component, psychological component, social component, and a functional and a spiritual component. So when you uh, try to address the symptom in palliative care, it is not just the physical symptom that we are looking at. We need to address each and every corner of the symptom. And only then you will be treating your individual as a whole and the symptom as a whole. Yes, and uh, even migraines, very common ones, but migraines also do cause. Yes. So some of the important causes of uh, GI issues in palliative care is because of oral thrush, candidiasis, also because of halitosis, because probably the patient has a poor oral hygiene. And halitosis itself probably is inducing some amount of nausea. Dysphagia, dyspepsia, all these things can contribute. Hiccups. How will the patient be able to take in food? And he is probably always having that rhythmic hiccups coming in that could itself cause uh, nausea and vomiting. 
and mucositis most often seen among uh, patients who are taking chemotherapy radiotherapy they have severe mucositis and uh, these can also lead on to uh, nausea and vomiting so how do you choose an antihistamine we have talked about n number of causes that is causing nausea and vomiting and how do you choose which uh, antiemetic should i be giving for this patient who has a a, a cause i mean a vomiting induced because of intracranial a raised intracranial tension which antiemetic am i going to give for this patient who has gastric passes so we need to identify the cause and by identifying the cause we are going to identify the pathway which triggers the vomiting reflex and once you identify that you would understand which is the neurotransmitter receptor that is involved and once you understand that you choose the most potent antagonist to that receptor which is identified and now you are set with your drug now you got to choose which is the route of administration so how would you like to prescribe your drug to a patient who has nausea and vomiting would you like to give the patient oral or would you like to give the patient parenteral yes someone who's having a severe nausea and vomiting when in the hospital parenteral yeah yes um dr nikhil dr kevin uh, dr pupamilla dr ramesh dr swati all of you do agree that if your patient is having severe vomiting you can go for uh, a parenteral route yes we have also a very interesting suggestion here you can go for sublingual route as well for severe vomiting yes so if uh, sometimes uh, a very commonly uh, used method nowadays is uh, giving sublingual uh, patches of ondansetron and uh, especially to children um children receiving chemotherapy i must say that you know uh, they enjoy having that uh, little strawberry flavored um uh, patch of uh, ondansetron so yes if it is not severe if it is not severe they are able to tolerate to some extent okay you can suggest uh, oral um, antiemetics but one thing that you ought to remember is that if you have a patient with severe nausea and vomiting and you have started the spacing down parenteral and the patient stops vomiting that does not mean that you stop the drug altogether so once the patient stops vomiting starts tolerating his oral feeds you slowly switch over you can taper the uh, iv or you can just switch over switch over to the oral drug and see how the patient is tolerating and how the symptom how well the symptom is in control and after that you start tapering that okay so once you the patient is on parenteral drug do not stop uh, the drug uh, completely just because the patient's symptoms are relieved you have to switch it over to oral uh, and then you have to stop it i mean taper it is well. okay now titrate the dose monitor the patient and administer regularly so if you are prescribing metoclopramide which has an action of about 6 to 8 hr uh, so you need to make sure that you are administering your drug every 6 hr or every 8 hr it doesn't help if you are going to prescribe your patient the drug uh, twice in a day okay in palliative care sometimes we uh, have to also give like you know four times a day uh, we have had to do that many a times for patients with severe vomiting we have uh, we have to sometimes you know uh, escalate the dose or sometimes the frequency uh, especially when it comes to terminal care right 
And uh, here, this is a diagrammatic representation, which is going to show you the pathways involved in vomiting. So like I was saying, once you identify what is the cause for the nausea and vomiting, this helps you to identify which is the pathway involved. And once you identify which is the pathway involved, it helps you to identify which is the receptor, the neurotransmitter receptor that is involved. Because that is what is going to help you to uh, choose your drug. So if the patient is having an anticipatory vomit, here, the receptor is at the cerebral cortex level. Okay. And if the patient is undergoing chemotherapy and that is inducing the vomiting, the receptor is in the CTZ, the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Whereas if it is a motion sickness, the receptors are seen in the vestibular system. Whereas if it is a raised intracranial pressure, uh, uh, pressure uh, because probably of a tumor or a bleed, that uh, the vomiting that happens over there is because the precious in, uh, receptors are getting uh, stimulated. So all these in turn go and uh, stimulate the vomiting center, which in turn causes emesis. So uh, you also have other receptors in the gut, um, in the liver capsule, in case of hepatomegaly, in the um, intestine, uh, because uh, in the, what, like what is seen in intestinal obstruction. And there is also this entity called as chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, CINV, radiotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, RINV. Right? So all these are those which uh, finally go and stimulate the vomiting center and causes emesis. Now to understand which are the receptors that are involved in each of these areas, I have, uh, I mean, this diagram has depicted it in colors. The serotonin receptors, the dopamine receptors, the cholinergic muscarinic receptors, the histamine receptors, and so on. Now having understood which is your receptor, you can choose your drug, from which is more sensitive. So this is a chart which is going to help you decide which drug for which receptor. So say suppose you have a chemotherapy-induced vomiting. So going back to the previous slide, you can see that chemotherapy-induced vomiting which, uh, you know, stimulates the uh, CTZ uh, where the receptors are uh, serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors. So the yellow color and the brown color. So what you need to do is that go to this chart and see where is the serotonin receptor, 5-HT3. Yes, so we can see 4 plus there for ondansetron and hyoscine. And uh, again, uh, because there are also dopamine receptors that are involved there, you can use, sometimes not just one antienetic is sufficient. You might have to use two antienetics if you're not able to control the symptoms. And there is no harm in using uh, two different type of antienetics. So root of antiemetic is as per the patient's condition and preference. So if the patient is able to tolerate some amount of um, feeds uh, uh, and is able to retain the medicine, and not that he vomits out right after taking the medicine. Yes, um, you can prescribe the patient an oral drug. And if not, you can prescribe a, a parenteral or sublingual, a subcutaneous, okay? An oral route is usually the best and the easiest way, but not always possible. And if vomiting is severe, yes, that's what we said, IV or subcutaneous or continuous subcutaneous infusion. Now, there are also suppositories available, sublingual, as we were talking about, and also transdermal patches. Now, uh, we have been talking about uh, the different drugs involved, but uh, again, as much as the pharmacological management, it is also important to address the non-pharmacological side of how you can manage these patients. 
So we were talking about, previously we were talking about the bad order. So likewise, a good uh, environment with a lot of fresh air, bed rest to avoid vestibular stimulation in case it is the vestibular pathway that is uh, involved. And if it is halitosis or oral candidiasis, a good oropharyngeal hygiene. And nursing the patient in an upright position. Now, sometimes what happens in bedridden patients is that, you know, the family is not actually aware of how to feed the, uh, feed the bedridden family member and tends to uh, keep the patient lying down itself and give the feed. So nursing the patient in an upright position and avoiding situations which induce nausea and vomiting and also allowing suitable distraction. Sometimes even, you know, distracting the patient with like uh, asking them to watch a movie or hearing to songs can also help. Other methods of distraction is uh, self-hypnosis, progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback, systemic desensitization. You know, these are uh, non-pharmacological ways of treating um, nausea and vomiting, uh, which is usually practiced by experts in these areas. This may not be something that you or me can probably do. We need a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist here to be doing uh, these kind of uh, distractive techniques. Okay. Now, uh, these are actually very useful in anticipatory moments. But it can also be used along with other anti -emitic. It helps to give the patient a good sense of control and reduce the feeling of helplessness. And how do you ask these patients to eat? They are having nausea vomiting. Like you said, it's going to compromise on their food intake, which in turn is going to affect their nutrition. So how are you actually going to advise them to eat? Yes, so you tell them to have small frequent meals. So if you have, a pay, uh, if you have uh, someone who is having a severe vomiting and nausea, you try to control the symptom and also try to make some non-pharmacological um, uh, non pharmacological suggestions which will help to bring down the symptom and also give them some advice on what they can eat how frequent they have to eat, and what is the amount that they have to eat. So ask them to split their three meals which they eat in a day to several parts. So eat small frequent meals rather than three large meals. And try to eat better, uh, like try to have the uh, most of the food in the morning hours during the daytime. Because it is usually observed that you know uh, they eat better in the morning hours, in the uh, in the early parts of the day rather than the evening. And also to uh, have uh, food and drinks which are easy to digest. And when the patient is nauseated, tell the family not to force feed them. Cold food or at room temperature are better tolerated. Sometimes hot, very spicy food can sometimes trigger nausea and vomiting and make it worse. And try to avoid fiber and carbonated drinks. So, Ma'am, uh, yeah. why to avoid fiber? Uh, because uh, why? Because you know it can also cause again stretch of the intestine, uh, mucosal stretch, and uh, say suppose the patient is also constipated, that could further aggravate the symptom, because constipation is also associated with nausea. And sweet food, sweet, sweet food. food, sweet and spicy food. All these can also sometimes uh, cause some gastroesophageal reflux which can uh, trigger the nausea and vomiting in patients who are already in this place. I thought sweet food will uh, in 
I mean, like improve the taste because I mean, there's loss of taste also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, there are two sides of looking at it. You know, sometimes if the fact that the patient is having nausea and vomiting because of this taste, or you know, they just so fed up of the same monotonous food that they are eating, maybe just having something that they like, something like a sweet food or you know, uh, a little spicy food like a biryani or something like that. Uh, something that is uh, of their own choice might help them to retain that food and uh, control that nauseating feeling that they are having. But otherwise, these can cause some amount of reflux and probably aggravate the uh, symptom. And also about the aerated carbonated drinks. Hmm. I mean, I've seen... Uh, like a patient diary given in CMC Velour for mm -hmm. cancer patient, which in fact suggest taking carbonated drinks for nausea. Yes, about the carbonated drinks, uh, yes, I have seen two sides of it as well. Sometimes patients do say that they feel so much better after having some soda and all that. That I have, I definitely agree to you. I have also seen that. But sometimes for some, it kind of uh, also becomes the next trigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. And ginger ale also, I mean, I have yes. seen many there. Yes. Ginger, yeah, ginger itself has um, anti-emetic properties. So, very true. That also causes, uh, I mean, it helps to bring down the nausea. So, uh, maybe, you know... Um, if the patient is having difficulty in eating because he's been prescribed special diet, like we were just talking about monotonous daily, you know, uh, same looking food or, you know, same uh, food that he's having every day. Uh, so this is because he is having a special, uh, uh, some ailment for which he is being prescribed a particular type of diet. So if they are on such stringent kind of diets, maybe a little relaxation during this time can help them. And uh, they can even take uh, consultations of dietitian for some tips. So what else can be done? Keep the mouth clean, do good oral care after each episode of vomiting and try to avoid tight clothes. So go for loose fitting clothes and a lot of fresh air, limit triggering factors like uh, loud sounds um, or smells, very uh, uh, pungent smells, uh, which can trigger. And also give them enough information of who to contact if their nausea and vomiting is not in control. So uh, what are the uh, guidelines? So like we said, find out the cause and find out what is reversible among them. So if the patient is having a gastric outlet obstruction, uh, which is leading to the nausea and vomiting, it is pretty much irreversible. Right? And so you try to find out what are the reversible causes and exacerbating factors over here and try to target on them and bring that uh, uh, bring down that issue. So if you are having some drugs, uh, which is ca uh, causing nausea and vomiting for your patient, try to substitute those drugs. Like if it is NSAIDs, try to substitute the NSAIDs. And, but in case of opioids like morphine, um, it is usually seen that uh, patients who are naive to opioids, mm -hmm. uh, they probably do develop nausea and vomiting and it kind of wears off in about three days. So what you could do is not uh, is that not stop your patient from taking their opioid or substituting it. Wait for a few days. Uh, give them um, recommended anti-emetics, uh, maybe in combination or single, and observe if they are not getting good control is only when you think of um, a substituting with another a strong opioid, okay? And uh, again, infections like urinary infections, most of the time you can see that, you know, uh, we have all seen that patients are brought in uh, with severe vomiting or um, very bizarre symptoms for urinary tract infection. 
so uh, it's just that sometimes when we are going on finding out what is the cause for the severe vomiting, we tend to find out that the patient has a urinary infection. So especially in elderly, uh, they have very bizarre preferences. So you review the dose of the drug that you have prescribed after 24 hours. And uh, once the uh, symptom is persisting, even after 20, 48 hours, you have to think up if there are any other contributing causes. So once you have found out this is the cause, okay, the patient with urinary tract infection has uh, nausea and vomiting. Yes, we all know that infection causes nausea and vomiting, but it is not getting settled. Is there something else? So it's time for you to think again, think again, is there some other contributing cause? And then you find out that the patient is constipated also. So that has probably kind of added on to the nausea and vomit. And then you try to manage his bowels. And then you find that the nausea is still persisting. And that is probably because of the antibiotics. So there's not, sometimes it's not just that, you know, there is one cause, there can be many causes. So according to that, you might have to add in your management accordingly. So one third of the patients may need more than one antiemetic, right? And if on parenteral, consider converting to oral after 72 hours of good control to oral regimen. So these are the, uh, the uh, commonly prescribed antiemetics, anticholinergics, neuroleptics, prokinetic drugs, so prokinetic drugs and anticholinergics, what I must just uh, put in a word here that when you are prescribing a patient who has come to you uh, with uh, severe vomiting and you tend to prescribe metacropamide, which is a prokinetic drug. And at the same time, the patient is having severe abdominal pain. So you are prescribing the patient also an anticholinergic like hyoscine butylbromide, buscopan. Now, what happens is that the prokinetic is trying to have a forward propulsion uh, of the gut, whereas the uh, anticholinergic is having more of an antispasmodic activity. So this counteracts each other. So uh, this is basically a cancelling effect over it. So try not to uh, combine uh, giving metacropamide and IOC to your patients. Uh, yes, we have a few um, responses here. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Biju was talking about less of spices, no fried food, but do not combine prokinetic with anticholinergics. Exactly. Constipation and urinary obstruction can coexist commonly. Yes. And he's also talked about the cancelling action. Yes. Now, anticholinergics, again, uh, they are given for uh, vomiting, severe vomiting, for also another effect that is anticholinergics like uh, hyosin uh, butyl bromide also has an anti secret reaction. Okay, it has an anti secret reaction. So it helps to uh, prevent fluid loss, uh, basically, in patients with. Uh, severe vomiting. It brings, the, it brings down the volume of the vomiting state. Okay. And again, uh, for anticipatory vomiting, what is most suggested is apripitant. It is an NK1 receptor antagonist. For apripitant is also available. Uh, apripitant is mostly a oral form given as three doses. And now we have also IV forms available. And besides all this, okay, so you, you all know of the antihistamines, the 5-HT3 antagonists, like all the Cetron, uh, you're all pretty much familiar with most of them. And uh, what we need to know is that uh, on Cetron is given daily. Granicetron can also probably be given repeatedly, um, you know, uh, probably repeated the very next day, very next day. That's fine. But palinocetron, you need to know that uh, it can be given, it can be repeated only once in three weeks, if I'm not mistaken, because it does have some cardiac um, 
uh, issues associated with it. And again, now talking about the adjuvant antiemetics. Adjuvant antiemetics, we have dexamethasone here. So a corticosteroid like dexamethasone has excellent antiemetic properties. And so is benzodiazepine. So a short-acting muscle relaxant, a benzodiazepine like lorazepam will also help your patient. And these two are, are one of my favorite drugs when I prescribe for uh, anticipatory vomiting. Yes. Um, yes, olanzapine. Thank you so much, Dr. Vidya, for that. Olanzapine is also another antipsychotic which can be used for um, as an antiemetic. And... Uh, Yes, Dr. Amrita also agrees to how benzodiazepines can be given for anticipatory uh, nausea and uh, and also uh, dexamethasone can be given for uh, vomiting due to raised intracranial tension. Yes. So this blue table was what we were looking at before and these are the commonly used drugs. So... Um, up in the list, we have haloperidol, haloperidol, which can be used for chemically induced nausea. Uh, Theranase, commonly called. Uh, we can start at a lower dose, like uh, say one milligram, 1.5 milligram to five milligram uh, per day, uh, orally or subcutaneously. Uh, this can be given if the patient is having uh, severe nausea. And again, metacropamide, Metacropamide, you can give it as frequent as four hourly if the um, uh, if the vomiting is severe, right? And uh, uh, one thing that we have to be careful of while using metacropamide IV parenteral is that uh, it has a potential for extra pyramidal effects, right? So uh, this is something um, I don't know how much of, uh, how many of you have seen metacropamide induced uh, extrapyramidal effects. It can be um, very scary. Um, yes, uh, um, metacropamide, uh, Dr. Wasanta was saying, you know, it can cause dystonia in the elders, but I have seen it uh, causing uh, extrapyramidal symptoms even in young people. And uh, yes, Dr. Nishat says that seeing that the bystanders might just turn violent. Yeah. And uh, that's very true. So you need to keep that in mind before you um, give your patient, uh, uh, before you give your patient uh, uh, metacropamide parenteral. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, we also have um, other other agents here like um, antihistamines, okay, and also like say a scopolamine, which can be given for uh, vestibular uh, uh, pathway um, stimulation, like the movement associated vomiting, right? And also antisecretaries like buscopan, which can be given uh, twenty milligram. Fourth hourly, um, or maybe just eighth hourly, right? And octreotide. Now, uh, hyosin uh, butyl bromide and uh, octreotide, these two are anti secretory agents as well, right? So they are basically anti secretory agents which help to bring down the uh, volume of the vomitus. Now, coming on to the next GI symptom, constipation. So when do you actually say that the patient is constipated? Uh, Vinita, uh, yeah. one minute. Um, yeah. 
so time is uh, seven yeah, yeah, yeah. five yeah so do you think uh, uh, constipation can be um, yeah, added sure. along with the next session oh yeah 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 we can do that we have to get on to the um uh, to, uh with the presentation right yeah yeah so, so you are so, taking the second part right yes yes so. yes yes okay. we shall move uh, constipation to the next yeah. class yeah sure okay uh, so uh, if anybody want to ask <coughs> any questions you can ask now <coughs> Can you tell a little bit more about those extra pyramidal effects of medical bromide? Uh, yes. Uh, basically, it's uh, uh, metoclopramide when it is given parenterally IV. Uh, what we have seen sometimes in patients is that uh, it can cause a severe type of dystonias, and uh, it is not that uncommon. So we have to keep a watch on that. And sometimes you might have to give antipsychotics. I mean, sorry, you might have to give sometimes phenergic uh, to counter that, to manage it. So uh, usually it doesn't uh, happen. Um, uh, it doesn't happen uh, uh, when we are giving oral that frequently. But with parental, it is commonly seen. Yes, Dr. Biju was saying it can be seen in children also. Yes. So regarding the extra pyramidal side effects, it can occur in many ways. Uh, so I so that there are many comments in the chat box, so which can include dystonia, so oculokairic guide, um, oculokairic uh, crisis, um, then abnormal movements of the um, lip. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, if you know that uh, it can produce, uh, then only you will pick it up. Otherwise, uh, you may not understand uh, is this an extra pyramidal side effect. And it is not very common. Uh, I have seen only for one or two patients uh, uh, during this 20 years in palliative care. Uh, but uh, it is it is a well-documented um, uh, problem and uh, it especially occurs when you give um, higher doses of uh, metoclopramide. <clears throat> uh, usually everybody gives up to 30 milligram, 40 milligram, but uh, managing bowel obstruction, we goes up uh, to maybe up to 100 milligram uh, per 24 hour. Uh, but even then, I have not seen it very commonly as I told you earlier. <clears throat> Sir, every ER room is giving only one densetron, but not the, they don't see the cause and uh, find the uh, antiemetic as you give the classification. Every ER room is physician is comfortable with the one densetron and pan. So that should be Sir, uh, This is uh, one thing which I want you to take it uh, from this lesson. Everybody is giving one densetron. But uh, under what basis? <clears throat> um, uh, you know that uh, uh, nausea one thing is produced because of uh, um, uh, stimulating various pathways. So you have to select those drugs which particularly block those neurotransmitters so that uh, it can have an immediate effect in relieving nausea and vomiting. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess uh, ondansetron also is mostly preferred by most physicians because they just think it is a centrally acting uh, drug right on the vomiting center. So they can um, uh, just use it as a blanket for many of the things. But those who prescribe ondansetron, they should also understand that uh, it can uh, also produce uh, side effects. And one, uh, one of the yes. common side effects is constipation, constipation. and another side effect is headache. So many patients who are on onansetron will come to you with constipation. That's also another problem. So what did you say along with constipation? What is the other side effect? Headache. It's headache. 
Thank you. Please to him. I want to ask regarding metoclopramide. Is it related with the speed of the injection which we give can lead to the extraparagnal side effects or not? Uh, no, I don't think it is related to the speed of the injection per se. Uh, Dr. Sunil, what do you think? Yeah, it uh, metoclopramide actually uh, crosses the blood-brain barrier and it induces... Uh, so whatever uh, be the route you are giving, uh, because uh, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, it reduces uh, extrapyramidal side effects in, uh, only in some individuals. Uh, so especially it is said that uh, you should not use uh, metoclopramide uh, for those patients with dementia or people with HIV uh, because uh, HIV is a neurotropic virus. Uh, so it, it, these all can be um, some uh, predisposing factors. So you should be a little bit careful, that's all. But uh, it uh, should not uh, um, uh, make you, um, or uh, you should prescribe uh, medical uh, even though it uh, has uh, extra pyramidal side effects. Uh, for that, uh, if you look at any medication, it has some uh, side effects, isn't it? So, but one of the rare side effects of medical is extra pyramidal. Uh, How expensive is a prepitrant? I'm not too sure. Is it like I think it's in around a uh, thousand? Yeah, it comes in a pack of three uh, tablets. And is that Dr. Ravi Kiran here? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, do you use subrepitant? Sir, yeah, for the chemotherapy, uh, we use for the first cycle, we see if the patient is okay. Uh, we don't use uh, 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 routinely with uh, prepitrant with the first cycle, but after the first cycle, if the patient has the vomiting and this thing, the second cycle onwards, we start with the injection of prepitrant. 120 mg day one and 80 mg day two, day three, followed by the oral medication. But we don't yeah. use routinely for each and every patient. Okay. So, Dr. Evikiran is a radiation oncologist. Okay, uh, I think um, uh, we can move on to the <clears throat> patient story, which will be presented by Dr. Gada. Yes, Dr. Gada. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Good evening to one and all, uh, Sri Priya. Uh, yes, ma'am. Anu will be sharing the screen in a moment. Next slide. Um, uh, today we are going to discuss about a 98 years elderly male who has a history of um, systemic hypertension and coronary artery disease for uh, past 10 years and been in hyperplasia prostate diagnosed three months back and uh, constipation hemorrhoids for two months and frailty because of his age. He came with the complaints of loose tools for uh, uh, three to four times a day and it is non-false smelling, not mixed with the blood and mucus and it was watery brown in color. And he gives history of loss of, related history of loss of appetite for 
two months and weight loss was there for nearly five to six kgs for two months. He had a abdominal pain on and off, uh, particularly on the left side, very occasionally. And he, he was bedridden for past two months. And there was no associated history of nausea, vomiting, fever, dysuria, no cardiac symptoms or no respiratory symptoms. Next. Uh, till January, he was all right. He was doing his routine, 98 years old man. He became breathless one day and was diagnosed with COVID pneumonia. And he was uh, uh, diagnosed with a multi-drug resistant bacteria after the ICU admission. Initially, he had a hematuria followed by clearance and a cloudy urine was there. And that uh, initially he was treated with antibiotics, but then culture done showed, cloudy urine showed uh, MDR bacteria. Uh, till that time at home, his bubble habits was normal, but uh, during hospitalization, it uh, started prolonging more than two to three days. Then after discharge and came back home, again, he, his uh, uh, bubble movements were once in four to five days. So the at hospital suggested the laxatives to be given and every alternate day 15 to 20 ml of lactose syrup was given. And he was uh, uh, started having loose tools after two to three days. But uh, so the lact lactulose was stopped uh, and uh, probiotics and ORS because it was loose tools for another five, four, four five days. Then they start, started uh, ORS and uh, probiotics. And once uh, loperamide stat dose was also given, even with this, the loose tools was not stopped. And uh, meanwhile, he related his complaint of his uh, loss of appetite and uh, noticed weight loss drastically. And uh, once he complained of pain while passing stools, that time only they noticed to have hemorrhoids and the anal up. Um, local applications of uh, Enovate cream was applied and that was temporary relief, but it is not uh, reducible hemorrhoids. And uh, uh, he had uh, in, uh, one episode of bilious vomiting and the family doctor and the doctor who treated him at hospital suggested X-ray abdomen erectin supine, suspecting some obstruction for bilious vomiting but the um, home x-ray was done. So meanwhile, the family doctor and the doctors at hospital uh, with the family relatives, they had a discussion what to do with this 98 year old man, how to proceed for that, whether he needs hospitalization. And they suggested, uh, they discussed with the palliative doctor and palliative doctor suggested it could be due to um, for elderly person impacted stools with spurious diarrhea is presenting like this. So you have to admit the patient for two days in the hospital, in their hospital, for giving enema as well as manual evacuation of impacted stools, then IV fluids and observe patient for one or two days, which the patient totally refused and he, he didn't want anything. Whatever treatment at the hospital, give it at home. That's what uh, he was telling. So relatives also requested for that. So all treatments uh, started at home only. Next one. Conscious, oriented, afibrile, very cooperative patient. And uh, he didn't have vitals or normal. Uh, systemic examination was normal. Only uh, fragile. He was very osteoporotic and he was uh, fragile, thin. And uh, his uh, abdomen was soft, no mass palpable, no distension of uh, abdomen. And periphery, they, he had hands and uh, feet, he had uh, edema, edema, and uh, he had mass, uh, market sarcopenia was uh, noticed. Next one. And uh, PR, sorry, PR was done, and that showed balloon rectum by the palliative care physician team came and did, and the three hemorrhoids was also noticed. So investigation, minimal investigation was done with the urea was, uh, ure, renal parameters was going up with potassium 4.6 millimoles. Albumin was very low and um, uh, hemoglobin was also low. X-ray abdomen, kindly comment on this X-ray. And uh, stool occult 
blood was positive no feature no ova cyst no stool culture was negative because liquid stools they did they themselves did the lab investigations treatment uh, prophylaxis as suggested by the uh, palliative care physician uh, prophylaxis enema was given at home by the brother and followed by digital ev evacuation of hard stools uh, that bristol chart uh, tab, uh, one and uh, he had a baseline hydration uh, with the iv fluids at home 30 ml per hour with a multi vitamin infusion was also given and uh, total parental nutrition and human albumin was suggested and uh, it was given once a week with careful monitoring by the caretaker sister um, with the right bp pulse and saturation and uh, uh, the relatives gave the appetite appetite stimulant syrups and the antispasmodic buscapen was given once in a while whenever he had that uh, um, he had that pain and analgesics uh, was also given in the form of syrup paracetamol and uh, anti hemorrhoidal cream also applied and uh, relatives meanwhile they planned for uh, giving comfort to the patient and not to trouble him much next so the psychosocial aspects in this case uh, he was very anxious when he was passing stools with pain why liquid stools is giving me pain we told even though they told that uh, hemorrhoids is there that was no anal fissure to, and um, he had that anxiety and he uh, as an elderly person and uh, young nurses are cleaning his anal region he was very uh he was feeling very discomfort for for his uh, cleaning the anal region and he was very discomfort because changing his position to right and left to avoid the bed sores pressure sores was also he felt and he refused admission as well as ng feeds because of his um, uh, age age and his uh, uh, decision making he refused any treatment from hospitalized treatment and uh, as it still 98 jan uh, 2022 january he was very active he became bedridden for past two months made him uh, regret and uh, uh, fi financially they were relatives were stable and they gave support to him in the form of alpha bed and uh, manual proper and good ventilation of anal region with fan and no pressure sores and the uh, wife was uh, they in a hospital and pilot her they suggested the husband my wife is 90 years old and they sleep in the same bed not to change the alpha hospitalized bed like so they uh, he was uh, wife was uh, next to him and uh, comfort and relatives started visiting him and uh, prayers chanting and his music uh, favorite music well also played he was uh, fed by the daughters with the Uh, they they were singing his uh, his favorite song and they were feeding him so same medication we discussed loose tools once the loperamide was given followed by ors and probiotics and uh, nutrition home made kanji and mixed vegetable soup was given along with the total parental nutrition as well as iv fluid with multivitamin infusion human albumin 20% was given for uh, 20 ml per hour for 5 hours and for impact test to sodium phosphate enema was given twice and um, twice manually evacuated and other uh, analgesics also given so the main concern are in four areas whether this diagnosis of impact test tools with spurious diarrhea of overflow diarrhea or false diarrhea was diagnosed very late whether it could have been done earlier uh, whether the malnutrition in the form of uh, loss of weight loss of appetite and uh, could be may maybe there may be hidden malignancy uh, undiagnosed malignancy whether prostate was high psa was not done it could be due to that or not or pain uh, during defecation is control uh, was the main Uh, we wanted to they wanted to give pain relief during defecation and they wanted to give comfort care these are the main areas they wanted to give so to summarize 98 years old elderly male 
known case of uh, hypertension and coronary artery disease with the uh, benign hyperplasia of prostate uh, was having normal bubble uh, movements, developed constipation and hemorrhoids. And he had blue stools later diagnosed as spurious diarrhea with impacted stools. Intermittent enema was given twice uh, uh, with a dig digital evacuation with the uh, relief. And his abdominal pain relief was given and uh, nutrition was supplemented at home. All uh, comfort care was given. One fine night, he had severe abdominal pain and he caused a large quantity of hot stools, impacted stools. Uh, so, and he became unconscious with credit pulse and hypotension. He was surrounded with his wife, daughters, and grandchildren. And with the spiritual support, patient quietly breathe his lost. Discussion points, whether the impact stools can be diagnosed earlier. Uh, would an early intervention by specialist can be helpful to the DA surgeon, could be helpful to the relatives or then from the uh, family physician? Is this a post-COVID sequelae? Because uh, uh, in whether the BHP, urosepsis, or the cause for the constipation. Can there be any change in treatment or management? Is it correct to give TPN at home, uh, albumin at home? Uh, how else can end of life can be given further? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Um, Thank you. Anybody sir. has... Uh, any comments uh, on this uh, discussion points? Anybody? There is no evidence of acute uh, intestinal obstruction, so I don't think that there is any uh, necessary necessity for the gastrointestinal surgeon to come and see him at home. So there's no surgical emergency there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yamini has put uh, uh, I think lobramide uh, would have worsened the situation. Sorry? This lobramide the once only stat dose only was given two milligram okay, madam. okay. Uh, after that uh, he didn't have because they for his age they suggested only the probiotics and uh, ors okay or kanji like that they were giving okay. madam tpn is not usually advisable uh, at home but uh, albumin can be given once at home. TPN was uh, given in the peripheral vein only and it was given for nearly 24 hours and he tolerated. Next, after giving TPN or albumin, he was energetic and he was uh, functionally, he was very well. That's what the relatives uh, felt. So yeah, peripheral vein, but not peripheral vein, they carefully monitored and uh, but not central. But risky only, risky only. Maybe Madam's class, after Madam's constipation class, it may provoke me many thoughts, maybe. Madam, BPH and locally uh, obstruction can produce constipation. Is this supposed to COVID circulate, sir? Because it can cause all the gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, cardiac and respiratory when they cause post COVID COVID circulate. I think it's just immobility. Was there immobility because of COVID? Yeah. I have seen a lot. Lots of COVID patients and even patients who didn't have COVID, but during the COVID times, they took lots of strong kadas and herbal Ayurvedic things, 
which uh, caused constipation and uh, uh, loose motions and all sorts of gastric symptoms in a lot of patients and even the hemorrhoids and fissures also so maybe if uh, that was related he didn't have anything he didn't have anything but immobile after the covid admission post discharge only he was immobile but we noticed one dexorange syrup in his uh, nearby his bed he Byron was Sir, taking uh, dexorange near his bed no. the is later they uh, showed that dexorange he used to take on his own that can but also be physician constipation but he didn't tell about any piles was there the hemorrhoids was there to the relatives okay um ma'am i had uh, just one input whenever an elderly individual or even in the pediatric age group when when they present with uh, you know just uh, uh, some amount of uh, uncontrolled leakage of stools very small volume stools maybe just the underwear staining or you know patient not able to control very slow volume you it's a very good indication of a possible uh, impacted stool uh, so you doing a pr at that stage itself would uh, save us a lot of trouble because you had uh, mentioned really? that na the low volume loose stools yeah, yeah. multiple yeah avinita you can you come in what does the x ray abdomen showing i could uh, osteoporosis and some few gas large intestinal fecal mass can you show the x ray sri priya that previous picture Uh, sure, I think I would need your help here. Uh, go back. Yes. These are the two. Here, I need an expert opinion, please, because he was not able to cooperate. He was he was held by two of his relatives and. bed x ray only i mean uh, home x ray bed x ray what was his calcium calcium and dr yadav are in here Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, can you comment on this X-ray? Uh, is actually I'm being in a mobile. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you zoom it up and see whether um, is there anything? This is not an erect X-ray, isn't it? So no, no, he was standing erect with the with the support only because okay. he was fragile he was bedridden only with the, they were holding him this is the distended bowel loops like this one no matter near the vertebra distended bowel black one yeah that itself just shows constipation or obstruction that should suggest this obstruction uh, in my opinion um, high degree of suspicion will should be there because he is immobile and bedridden and uh, palpation in palpation like in the left uh, side where uh, Uh, if we can palpate uh, lumpy mass or per rectal examination and this x-ray all this could lead us to constipation as a diagnosis there is yeah. a cult blood positive in the stool maybe there is some uh, space occupying lesion because the hemorrhoids will give you uh, fresh blood if if that was the cause uh, i think uh, 
hemoglobin is low uh, showing that there has been a chronic blood loss so uh, i don't think it's an hemorrhoids can be just uh, be the only thing my prayer can you take the again call the questions okay sir i was just trying to zoom the extra so you want to go to the discussion points right yeah, now, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. it's okay it's okay mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Yadav, can you see the X-ray now? He has got severe scoliosis. Yeah, scoliosis is there. But what mm-hmm. about uh, intestinal obstruction which is there? Uh, I, think there is any, uh, I don't think there is any feature size of intestinal obstruction. But in this patient, I think uh, we, need to, uh, we, uh, we should have rolled out some malignancy. Especially with the loss of weight, that kind of say 8 to 10 kilograms mm-hmm. loss of weight. And all those serious diarrhea, constipation, etc. Uh, as a surgeon, I, I will first roll out malignancy. We'll do a co- uh, actually because especially my um, uh, uh, and patient is anemic. Uh, patient has got uh, serious diarrhea, constipation, loss of weight, and all. So this also has some kind of underlying uh, uh, colonic malignancy. Yeah. But sir, um, even if you diagnose malignancy, what is the point? He is 98 years old. Are we going to do any yeah. acute? Yeah, I, I, I told you as a surgeon, but in this patient, we, don't, we, we can't offer you nothing at all. Yes. So I think palliative care was the best. Yes, we need a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I think <clears throat> the perplexing point here is that are we looking at a malignant uh, intestinal obstruction or are we looking at a constipation? So... In this X-ray, I mean, uh, we are not able to comment as such like the typical air fluid levels that we see in a uh, intestinal obstruction. We are not able to actually make it out that well. I think you know, uh, a clinical exam, a simple clinical examination, like um, checking for the bowel sounds. So, if it is a constipation, you would still get some bowel sounds. Uh, whereas it could be, um, it, it might be absent for uh, intestinal obstruction or borgogy sounds. Uh, there are few, I think we will be coming to the those uh, areas in our next class. And uh, uh, regarding, uh, that would be about the x-ray. And uh, there were a few other questions. Uh, yeah, the few other questions um, uh, can impacted stools be diagnosed earlier? That was already being answered. Uh, yeah, a digital uh, examination per rectum can definitely uh, help you diagnose it earlier. And again, the specialist, we really uh, can uh, detect uh, uh, impacted stool even uh, before having a specialist there. And urosepsis, is it a cause for constipation? I think it would be the other way around that constipation itself could lead to residual urine, which could uh, probably, um, you know, in turn cause uh, UTI and uh, urosepsis. Uh, I, I, the sequelae seems uh, more in that way that is more commonly seen in patients. And TPN uh, being given at home, yes, TPN is also available um, uh, through peripheral um, uh, you know, which can be given peripherally, the peri cabivan and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, the rule, the dictum is that, you know, uh, parental nutrition, total parental nutrition are uh, meant for those patients who have a survival benefit of more than three weeks. Uh, so uh, we might have to carefully plan our patients accordingly. And uh, albumin as such, even a, a protein diet or egg whites can be substitutes. Albumin, uh, as such, a correction is meant when we are dealing with infections because they increase the morbidity of the patient. Uh, But I think in a um, terminally ill patient, we need not be too overwhelmed uh, about uh, the albumin level uh, because we have to concentrate more on treating the patient than the uh, parameters. And uh, uh, you would give albumin only to a patient who might be having cirrhosis with low albumin. That might help for mm-hmm. but not in this case. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that is what I would like to 
put in suggestions and even the pain factor of the uh, constipation uh, on defecation i think the pain itself will further worsen the constipation um, so the pain has to be treated with a lot of importance and again lopramide uh, i don't think it is an appropriate suggestion for someone who's having a serious diarrhea uh, so because it altogether you know uh, ceases the motility of the intestine so probably a rasicodotril which helps to you know uh, um, uh, increase the uh, uh, make the fecal mass more formed is a better choice i think yeah that's all i would like to add ma'am uh, could you repeat this which drug did you say resicodotril it's a stool bulk enhancer yes yes yeah rather than going for anti motility drug yeah it is that uh, that kind of trend is often seen uh, even with mm. two uh, episodes of uh, loose stools people just mm. immediately take it though yeah. Mm. self medication because it's an o otc drug so hmm hmm yeah okay ma'am so resicodotril won't worsen the impaction uh we will have to treat the impaction but if the um if it is uh if the loose stools is very distressing and you know uh you want to manage it uh otherwise uh is what a suggestion that i gave but otherwise furious di diarrhea has to be treated by digital evacuation and clearing of the bubbles completely with laxatives thank you yeah yeah mm. uh, ma sir ma uh, one more dot we have to give enema only or any other laxatives would uh, help in the uh, impacted stools um and uh, i Dr. think uh, Abhi, sorry you got muted in between i guess yeah uh, enema uh, enema usually which is tried for um, fecal impaction is a high end enema because you uh, most often what we see is that when we do a digital uh, examination is that hard fecal mass is there or there is ballooning that is seen of the um, uh, canal and so what we do is that we have to um, uh, attach in a catheter and then push the enema uh, so that process is called as high end enema uh, laxatives take time to act uh, basically so uh, when the patient comes with impacted stools and with a serious diarrhea we would like to treat it acutely you know in some small amount of time rather than waiting for the action to actually happen so thank you uh so uh, diagnosing uh, impacted stools the easiest way is taking history so this is uh, most probably a bedridden patient a elderly patient who comes to you and tell you that uh, i have frequent loose stools which is small in quantity and uh, uh, they pass uh, this uh, fluid uh, um, fecal matter on straining maybe on cough or whenever they have some strain uh, they have some loose uh, stools uh, uh, so that should actually uh, alert you that uh, this might be an impacted stool uh, so that's how you have to diagnose and i agree with vinita in all other points um, and um, yeah i think uh, we have to write up the session it's already 7:45 so thank you um, vinita uh, for being with us and uh, taking an excellent session on nausea and vomiting and thank you dr ratha uh, for um, presenting a excellent patient story thank you everyone and thank you all uh, thank you for all. your active participation Thank, thank you, you Dr. Sunil. Thank you, uh, Pali of India, and thank you to all the participants. Uh, your interaction was fabulous. It gave me the energy to go forward, and looking forward to more interactions in our next session. Thank you. Sure, ma'am. It was uh, heartwarming to have you back uh, with the one of the most vibrant sessions as usual because you were you are one of those few faculties who give us the. maximum guarantee for the sessions and today also you proved that thank you so much and we do eagerly look forward to your next session
So with the promise that we will again meet up with uh, Dr. Vinita Riju in the next session. This is Sripriya along with Dr. Sunil Kumar signing off from the Tips Eco Hub. Till the time we meet again, everyone stay safe, be happy. And please don't forget to leave your feedbacks because it is very valuable for us. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.